Uh, my name is Nicholas Jones. I want to give a, a really warm, wet welcome to all of you uh, listening live right now. And uh, I really want to say something to everybody who's listening in the future because uh, we're creating something for, uh, you know, it's almost like a timeless conversation. So I know that some of you are listening to this now on a recording. And I want to say a very warm welcome to you too because um, you're holding the space of the future right now and you don't even know it. Um, so listening on the call, you might be a, you might be a track pilot, a uh, paddler, you might be an experienced adventure guide or a beginner. Um, uh, and it might be all new for you, this whole world of paddling and, and, and you know, water. And you might have nothing to do with paddling and you're just curious. Um, we know that you could be listening from a lot of different places, even though most of you on the call right now are very familiar with water. Just want you to know you're in the right place. And uh, I'm speaking from track headquarters in Airdrie, Alberta. To my right is Curtis, he's out of frame here, but he's gonna help me manage the chat window. And uh, there's a team here and Nolan is also in Airdrie, uh, speaking from his home. Uh, and yeah, it's been wet here, it's been raining for days. Uh, Nolan and I were joking that we should stop this conversation, it's too powerful, <laughs> it's too much conversation for water, because it is just coming down and coming down. And last time that happened, we had some floods here in, in, in Alberta uh, in 2013. So we're really grateful that you joined. Um, we want to know that we appreciate your listening. Your listening helps create this conversation uh, and what it's being offered in the conversation. Uh, I want to say we wouldn't be able to create it without you. That's how much we honor you as the listeners, even if you're muted. Um, we may not know each other, uh, but we're all connected by virtue of one thing, water. The water that we have in common, it's been around for millions of years. It's the water that connects us and it flows inside us and around us. Uh, you know, so as you join, you know, please let us know if you're coming onto the call now and, and even if you're already on the call and you have access to the chat window, um, please let us know where in the world you are right now uh, and what the closest body of water is to you. I mean, really, if it's just a bathtub, that's fine. <laughs> but if it's an ocean, if it's a river, if it's a lake, let us know what that is. We're gonna circle back and, and, and get some of those bodies of water uh, later as Curtis, uh, Curtis collects it. So welcome to Wellness Equal Water series, right? We wanna, we wanna talk about the series a little bit because it's the first one. Uh, you're listening to a new series on tracks existing Zoom Away Blue Fridays, uh, but this is a new conversation. It's like a gift. It's one that we're hoping will engage, enrich and empower you. Uh, and it is for you. So you're invited to a whole new kind of flow with track. If you're a paddler, an outdoor enthusiast, uh, if you already know like the positive benefits of being in, on, and around water, uh, let's say that it turns out there are deeper and inherent reasons for that. So the premise of this conversation is that if our understanding of water and our relationship with water is true, then it follows that we will be well. So we're not saying that everything we know about water is wrong or not true. It's that there's much more to unpack, to reveal, and inform us about water. And that's why we were compelled to create this series. We wanna open up some new dimensions of water that we haven't experienced to, experienced or we're not aware of. So we hope in this series, they are revealed to create a more complete picture. In other words, we don't wanna take water for granted. And we're not just talking about planetary ecosystems or local recreational water, or even your drinking water. We're talking about the whole world of water. In this series, Wellness Equal Water, we're gonna take a journey with you to discover the connection between water and wellness within. We'll attempt to unpack the many dimensions of water and how it impacts human health and biology and the health of the planet. So join us and help us create a blueprint to navigate this journey, leading the way to uncover the source of human vitality and possibly redefine our understanding of a new biology and the life charging qualities of water. That's what this is about. So I want to say a few words about me. Uh, this person talking is new for you. Many of you have never, never, never heard of me or know who I am, but I've actually been working with track for about 13 years. Uh, Nolan and I go back about 15 years. Uh, I stepped up to be the host of this and the co-creator because it's a subject that's fascinating to me. It's part of the whole wellness uh, paradigm that I'm engaged with. Uh, I'm a corporate shaman. I'm a truth seeker and a sense maker, and my job is to bring back spirit into work, to draw from sacred, natural, and universal principles to help businesses prepare the way to lead the future that serves humanity. So I'm no expert, 
and I always have more questions than answers. <laughs> it irritates Nolan. <laughs> so it really is an honor to be part of the team creating this series. And I'm constantly asking why. I try to keep a beginner's mind, uh, always to get the most out of life and hopefully walk away with some wisdom. To use water as the analogy, I know I'm, I'm one drop in the ocean, but that really empowers me. Knowing the truth is the whole ocean and that we're each as a drop whole and complete and that we each make up the ocean. So that's how I'd like to start. And I'd like to introduce uh, Nolan Bayard, our founder and managing director, who's gonna introduce the why of how this conversation started in the first place. So I'm gonna turn it over to Nolan for a few minutes uh, to set the stage before we jump in. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, I guess the place I wanna start is, is just I'm, I'm super grateful to be here, you know, in this moment with, with all of you. Um, it's uh, humbling to see all the uh, familiar faces, familiar and beautiful faces and names uh, that's joined us here on the call. Um, yeah, like Nicholas said, you know, the, the whole concept of wellness equals water, you know, a wellness equals water series. Why, why that from a portable sea kayak company? Uh, you know, we like to, you know, stir things up a little bit, but it's, there's something a lot deeper and more meaningful here in terms of where we've come. Uh, I've been uh, behind track now for uh, over 15 years. And, uh, you know, I've seen, I've obviously been on a lot of ups and downs of waves uh, over the course of time with track. And, uh, uh, but overall, really, it's been such an incredible uh, gift uh, to, be in service of, of helping people, you know, experience water. Uh, and I guess that's where it came from was that there's this sort of intuitive draw that I've, I've had. And, and I guess probably a, a sort of a, a subconscious uh, knowing of the power of water uh, over that, over that course of time. And, you know, I regularly get goosebumps when I hear stories from, you know, track, paddlers and I, I see Cole on the line here and, and many of many of the others uh, when I hear of the stories of the kinds of experiences that people get to have and this sort of true vitality that comes from really connecting deeply uh, with water. Uh, but I guess I would say the big reason for doing this whole thing is that there's like a whole different way uh, or a different lens uh, to look at human health. Um, and, and what's kind of come to me and what I've uh, I guess, drawn out uh, over the course of my 15 years is that, you know, uh, it starts with water, that whole new vantage point of health really starts with water, like right at the cellular level. And it's been intriguing and fascinating to uncover some of this stuff and see the kinds of people out there uh, doing this work uh, that's not part of a current paradigm. Uh, but I think all of us intuitively that are drawn to water know that that's, there's something about it, right? There's something about it that really is intriguing. And so uh, this series is really uh, kind of a, you know, the approach is to bring some of these, uh, you know, amazing thinkers and, and scientists and, and other revolutionary minded human beings uh, on this show and really to unpack it, like Nicholas said. And, uh, and it's just a fascinating thing. And I'm, I'm looking forward to having you all come along on this uh, uh, unpacking process. Uh, so I'm really, really intrigued by this. And, uh, you know, water really connects us all. Nicholas talked a little bit about this. Uh, what I've discovered is the symbiosis between the, you know, between, uh, you know, a symbiosis among human health, you know, the, uh, our, our biology, our human health and the health of the planet. And, it's symbiotically tied together is, is what I've come to, to learn. And I'm sure a lot of you uh, feel that as well. Um, so there's, there's all these dimensions to water and so much beauty to it. We're going to just really unpack this over the course of the series through, you know, interviews with some amazing people. And so let's get started. Uh, let's, let's start unpacking this and I'm going to turn it over uh, back to Nicholas. Uh, it's quite interesting. I'm, I'm super excited to have uh, Jay. Uh, who you'll hear, Wallace J. Nichols. Uh, so J. Nichols on this, and then we've got Nicholas Jones hosting. So the N's and J's are uh, uh, flourishing. <laughs> Little fish uh, But what I'll do is I'll pass it back to to Nicholas, and I'm really, 
uh, you know, very grateful to have Nicholas host this series for us. Uh, he and I go way, way back and have uh, an incredible relationship and partnership. And I know it's a passion of yours, Nicholas. And so for you to be able to come in and, 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 and direct this conversation, uh, you know, draw it out, uh, work with, with these kinds of people that we're interviewing, it's, it's just really, I feel very grateful uh, and it feels like the flow is right. So let's, uh, let's, let's get, <laughs> kick this thing off. And well, get but no, listen, you got, you got to get this for people, right? For everybody that uh, the first time I got into a kayak, a track, it was a track. First of all, the first time I got into a kayak, it was a track kayak. <laughs> and you remember where it was, right? It was, it was, it, you know, at 8,000 feet elevation on Lake Titicaca. <laughs> That was my first experience with you. <laughs> and I was like, oh, by the floating the, islands, the floating islands. Right. I think that's yeah. so cool to think of the, think of, think of the, the river we've traveled down. Right. You know, since then. Right. And the, and, and that's really cool. And I want to acknowledge you as a founder of track and, and, and the managing director, because really you're templating something here with a company, Nolan, as a vehicle, you're templating something where in the operating system of a business, we can have, start to have a more regenerative philosophy, a more, an operating system that, that deals with the future in a more humane way and starts to take responsibility and stewardship at a whole different level. I think it's a very uncommon conversation. That's why it's a privilege for me to be part of it. But if you're going to guinea pig it and template it, uh, and, you know, and, and with Jay here being part of that process, that is awesome, right? I think that's the way that corporations need to work in the future. So that's just a little plug for the future of track. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let's move on. The conversation is going to be about 45 minutes long. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a 10 or 15 minute QA at the end. So again, please, if you have comments, questions, you want to share a story, put them in the chat window. Curtis is furiously managing that right now. And I didn't want these conversations to be structured. Obviously, I'm reading some things and you know, I've got some things written down because I don't want to forget them. Um, but we want it to flow with intentionality. It has, a, it has a subject line, it has a theme. Um, so flowing like a strong, mature river, intentional but meandering, uh, and we still get to the ocean. Uh, we just ask you to flow with us, right? It might meander, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna have some fun here. Um, and uh, so you're all muted to keep your sound quality as good as possible, and uh, we'll unmute you when uh, the Q&A comes up, okay? So I wanna, I wanna start by introducing uh, our guest today is Wallace J. Nichols. Um, uh, known, known as Jay, and we're happy with that. It's nice and short. Um, our guest today is going to set the stage for the whole series. So it really is a privilege to have him. And it'll push us off from the banks of the river and open up the conversation to start this journey. The mainstream media introduces him as a scientist and a New York Times bestselling author. Like he's very accomplished. But by the measure, that's, you know, by, by the measure of the role he plays in the world today, he's much more than that. Only a scientist would say that he began life as a zygote in the womb. <laughs> but then only a steward of our planet's water would acknowledge that the first water he swam in was his private ocean called Mum. I was really touched by that. I've never heard anybody speak that way. And it got my attention. He's being called a keeper of the sea, a visionary, a water warrior, and a friend of the sea. He's innovative, silo busting. He's an entrepreneurial scientist. He's a movement, movement maker a renowned marine biologist, he's a voracious earth and idea explorer, he's a wild water advocate, I love that term wild water, he's a best-selling author and he's a lecturer and he's a dad and he loves turtles, this is great. So Jay is creating the new story of water and he's sharing it with the world. This story includes cognitive, emotional, psychological, social, physical and spiritual benefits that we can all derive from healthy waters and oceans throughout our lives. So the book I'm holding up now, this is his book. It's called Blue Mind, and it was his gift of his words to the world. So I want to throw the first drop of water into the flow, introduce Jay, and I want to kick this off by acknowledging that I'm 70% water. We're all about 70% water. The earth is about the same at 70 cent water. And we say if you know your water, you know yourself. You were born in water, like Jay said so beautifully. You cannot live without water. And if we move beyond just managing it or using it as a resource, there is a boundless gift available. So let's jump into the deep end. On behalf of the track community, we're delighted and grateful to welcome Jay to join us now. So Jay, where are you right now? And what's the closest body of water to you? Well, I, uh, I reside on the shores of the Monterey Bay in California, right in central California, which is 
not only a beautiful place to live, it's a great place to kayak. And I just wanted to put that in there. Um, Monterey Bay is in our backyard, literally. And uh, we get, we get our, our drinking water at home from Mill Creek. So our fresh water comes from literally out of the creek that runs by. And then our, our backyard is the, the Monterey Bay. So pretty fortunate in terms of our local waters. Um, but I want to say thanks. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this. It's been, uh, you know, the conversation with this team has started a while ago. And this is the, you know, the, the latest piece of it that we're sharing here. But it's been really a joy. Um, every interaction we've had through, through text message and emails and, and Zoom calls and conversations has been a, um, I've learned a lot already from all of you. So thank you. And, Really good to be part. I just want to add, I think uh, you mentioned the one drop. I think both Nicholas and Nolan are two drops. You each, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to count you each as two drops uh, just because of the, the impact of your, your work and your words. So thank you for being. Awesome. Well, let's go, let's go paddling, right? So <laughs> yeah. I want to I wanna, I wanna ask the first question. And, and, it, and it, it's so literally obvious, but um, I do have to ask it because you are, are the, are the, are the, the the water whisperer. So what is water? What is water? That's yeah, yeah How really do you that's define the, water. Well, you know, it's it you know you you can take any any one of approaches to that. You've got obviously the, the chemical approach, you know, the, the physical uh, sort of shape of water. For me, um, when I really strip it down um, and get take off the, the scientist, chem, chemist, biologist hat and just put on the human hat. Um, water's been my best friend since I can remember. And I think it will be uh, to, through the end. I think it's, um, it's gotten me through uh, good times and bad times and really tough times. Uh, literally, it keeps us alive, of course. But it's it's my go-to, you know, and and um, uh, that that best friend status is is a coveted phrase. Uh, it means a lot. You know, I have two teenage daughters, and talk about best friends. It's you know, it's a it's a highly coveted competitive um, status uh, in one's life. And so for for me, my my water is my best friend and uh, sweet a reliable friend. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I love that two drops, but, uh, when you say, when you say, you know, you talk, you're hinting at your, your journey with water. What, what is your, what is your journey with water in a classic hero's journey sense? You're a writer. Um, I mean, you, you fully understand that. Um, what was that moment that, um, that the gift appeared for you, I guess, is the question. Um, yeah. I, if I go way back, you mentioned, you know, that I wrote about that time that we all spent, approximately 9.21 months inside our private oceans called mom. Um, don't really remember a lot of that. Uh, although it was a pretty, pretty good long time uh, that we all did something of, of that sort. Um, but I can remember early, early on, as far back as I uh, can recall, dreaming about water uh, as a child, as a very young child. And those were my favorite dreams. And the reason I remember those dreams, even though they were very early and they're probably preemptive as far as your, you know, your earliest memories that you can really recall, I think the reason I remember them is every night I try to redream them. So just the act of trying to dream something brings it from that initial dream state into the longer term memory. So if the dream actually occurred when I was around three years old, by trying to dream it every night, it carried, it carried the story forward into, into a more long-term memory. And so my earliest memory of water is in fact a, a dream of water. And I won't go into all the details, but we, it was my birthday party. <laughs> and uh, we, my buddies and I dove into a, uh, a teacup full of water and the teacup became un unbelievably large as we dove and it became an ocean sized teacup and we dove down and retrieved iron figurines and each of us had a different figurine. Mine was a grizzly bear, a little iron grizzly bear. And uh, Steve got a car. And uh, Anyway, so we, we dove down for those and 
in my birthday party. Everybody got a gift and we had to retrieve it from the water. And I just loved, I loved the way the water felt in my dream so much um, that I wanted to keep dreaming it every night. So I tried and that kind of carried forward. Um, parallel to that as a young person, the, uh, I, was, I was adopted and um, stuttered badly. I was pretty, what people would call an introvert right now. Um, people always said, why are you so shy? And I'd say, I'm not shy. I think to myself, I'm not shy, I'm just paying attention. I wouldn't be able to say that because my words wouldn't really come out right. But um, underwater, I was more at home than uh, on land on the water, near the water, in the water, under the water, is where I wanted to be because it was quiet and nobody asked you difficult questions, uh, such as, why are you so shy? To which I had no answer. Um, they don't ask you questions underwater. So that was my happy place. Um, that led me to want to you know, pursue a life and a career associated with water. And I, I chose marine biology uh, because pro surfer, was a door that closed very early on for me. Uh, not an option, not that talented. Um, chose marine biology and um, but came back to this, that, that question of yours there, you know, further down the road. I wondered what is, what is really going on here? What is this pull um, that changed my life, directed, directs my life, directs a lot of our lives. We, we, uh, the pursuit of good waters um, is a big part of who we are and how we live and where we live and who we spend our time with. Um, and so that's, uh, that's kind of how I came back around to um, the blue mind conversation. And I'm just, it just occurs to me, somebody, we want to check on Alexander over there. I don't know if he's doing all right there. Just make sure, nudge Alexander and the tap on the shoulder. Kind of leaning back hard on his chair there, make sure he doesn't. Okay, good. It's good. Never mind. Just making sure you're feeling okay there, Alex. Sorry to interrupt the flow. Oh, it's all part of the flow, um, <laughs> Jay. I mean, that's that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. That's really what it's about. That connection. Mm -hmm. So, somewhere along the way, this this happened, right? Yes. And, and uh, you're really humble, you know, like you're really humble about the journey and, and, and you know, speaking to my language, when you talk about dreaming it into existence, you know, when I hear the, the early genesis of it. Um, yeah. but, but then this gift got delivered to the world. But, but when did you realize it was going to have to be formed like this um, and, and into a coherent, you know, form of words? Yeah, you know, when it, when it occurred to me that a, that a book about neuroscience, neuropsychology meets, meets water would be useful as a marine biologist and as um, somebody working to fix broken parts of the ocean and endangered species. When I had that, that insight, I guess, I went looking for the book that I wanted to read. And uh, I figured I'd check it out of the library, or I'd buy it from a bookstore and I'd read it and then apply it to, to our work. And when I went searching for the book, um, I had a hard time finding it. Uh, I thought, well, maybe it's, maybe it's out of print. There's gotta be, I mean, there, at the time there were these great books about your brain on music, your brain on happiness, um, your brain on mindfulness, obviously, and meditation, and a, a whole, there's a whole section of the library now, your brain on, fill in the, your brain on bowling, your brain on chocolate, your brain on technology, um, Exaggerate, exaggerating a little, but yeah. not really. Uh, so I figured water, right? You started out by saying it's most of the planet, it's most of our bodies. Not a niche -y topic. You would think there would be a book about your brain on water. Yeah. And uh, of course there would be. Maybe there'd be 17 of them. And when I went searching for it in order to read it, in order to use it, I didn't find it. And I was disappointed, but I thought, okay, there's an opportunity. Uh, I know some people who should write that book. So I tried to convince them. Uh, <laughs> I gave my research to them. I gave my, I offered my time, um, editorial skill, 
uh, all in exchange for a mention in, in the acknowledgments. I just wanted somebody to write that book so I could read it so that I could use it. And uh, great man, the late great uh, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who was a neurologist and a big idea guy and an explorer and uh, lover of music and a lifelong lover of water. Um, I pitched the idea to him thinking, wow, if, if Dr. Sachs wrote this book that I'm so anxious to read, it would be a very, very good book. I'd be honored to help him. Um, and when I pitched it to him, he said, that's a fine idea. You do it. And I can remember that moment so clearly because it was not a suggestion. He was not saying, hey, maybe you should think about writing it. That might be a good idea. It was uh, a mandate. It felt, felt like a, a commandment. Um, and that's, you know, that's an interesting topic to dig into, right? Because I had already given him the authority in my intellectual life, at least, um, to hold that role. When he said that, I, I took it that way. It, it still rings in my ears that way. And the only answer I, I could conjure up was yes, sir. Uh, and then five years later, I presented to him with a hard first edition hardcover copy uh, in New York City, where he lives, lived, and um, closed the loop on that that um, that mandate and delivered the the book. Uh, shortly after that, he passed away, and um, um, so I was fortunate to have been guided and suggested and, um, and then, you know, have that part of the journey include him and then hand him the completed project, uh, the task as if, if you will, um, you know, mandated by the master in, in uh, a sense. Um, so that's how it happened. I, I did not, I did not wake up as a kid or and say, I'm going to write a book about water and the brain, water and emotion. Uh, I ended up doing it quite begrudgingly, I guess you could say. So it's not a, it's not a false sense of humility. That's the truth right there. It was not um, sort of, you know, pl you know, a master plan or a, a destiny. It was just like third, third choice. I was the third choice. <laughs> well, I'm glad Bibble Baggins lis listened to Gandalf. <laughs> Whether I could be told him like the dragons you're going to eat, going to mess you up, he wouldn't have gone. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. So, so that's so, so perfect. That's so beautiful. It's just so archetypal, you know, to be so reluctant and then, and then be told, no, it's actually your book. <laughs> uh, but what a, what a journey. Um, so in terms of that, Journey, Jay, did, what, what waters did you travel? I mean, just over literally geographically and literally, um, because everybody on this call is called in from a different part of the world. Yeah. And so where did it take you? Like, what are some of the unique places you've been in and around water, uh, you know, in your own personal research? I spent a lot of time in Latin America over the years, um, every inch of the coast of Mexico, starting from Texas all the way down to Belize, then across and up from Guatemala, uh, all the way up to California, including Baja California. So I've traveled and camped and paddled and surfed and been diving and turtling, mostly turtling, um, along, along most of the coast of Latin America. I spent a fair amount of time in Peru, uh, Indonesia, Japan. Um, the first several decades, my, my work uh, was led primarily by where, wherever the sea turtles took me. So we tracked a turtle from Baja, Mexico to Japan. So that clearly, you know, we put a satellite transmitter on her and she swam uh, 12,000 kilometers due west. So that opened an, another door. So I had to go to Japan, didn't have to go, I desired to. It went to Japan, followed the turtle to Japan, literally, uh, and then began getting more involved in the waters and oceans there. Um, spent time in, in, in Europe and in, you know, Scandinavia, um, studied in Spain, um, but primarily Latin America. And then of course, all over the US. I think between the research for the book and then sharing these ideas, uh, I've been fortunate to visit 48 of the US states 
um, a number of, of uh, wonderful visits to, to Canada, both coasts, uh, as well, uh, Alberta. Um, and, uh, you know, so, every, you know, not to just, I don't want to list off bodies of water, but lots of, everywhere I go, I try to, try to get into the water, you know, find the people who know uh, the local knowledge and, and find the local guides and go, you know, go check it out. Um, I'll throw also include, I don't, pretty ecumenical about my water. So swimming pools, public pools, uh, private pools, uh, float spas, um, urban fountains, urban waters. I, 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 uh, I've done some illegal things with urban <laughs> waters. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's talk about that. I think that's <laughs> <Yeah>. awesome. <laughs> no, let's talk about these la the language of water. Like I know you, 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 you talk about wild water, domestic water. You know, like the the Inuit have like they say up to hundred names for snow. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 I and I caught that about you. And it's like share a little bit more about about how you relate to water because it's such a rich world for you and yeah. those different different ways of referring to it. Well, you, you know, you, you touched on it earlier that, you know, the, the waters we deal with daily, you know, that come out of our, our, our pipes and our homes, it's the water that's been around forever, I mean, essentially forever, since the beginning of this planet. Some of that water has come in on other, other bodies, you know, asteroids, meteors that have impacted the planet and brought more water. Uh, NASA would suggest, their research would suggest half, as much as half of the water has been imported uh, from off of Earth. That's just, frankly, mind-blowing. So that's the water that we get to, get to uh, live with. And it may be coming out of the pipes in your home. It may be in the glass that you drank this morning, uh, in your shower, in your bath. So in a way, there's no, these categories don't matter. It's just it's the, all the water being cycled and recycled and reused and breaking apart and coming together and moving through its various you know, phases and stages. Um, so does, as a backdrop, I, I do refer to domestic water as the water we, we experience you know, in, in tanks, in tubs, in, in pipes, in storage. It's the water that's sort of in, in our control uh, and then I refer to wild water as the water that's sort of doing its own thing. So our lakes, our rivers, our creeks, our ponds, the water falling from the sky, the clouds, water vapor, the ice and the snow, of course, the ocean and the bays. Um, then there's urban water, which is a little bit in between. It's, it's, it's somewhat captive, it's somewhat domesticated, but it's, it's out there in the city, uh, maybe in the form of a fountain or a pond in Central Park. So it's sort of semi, semi domestic. Um, and so I like to give a shout out to the urban water because it's so special to so many people. And it's, uh, it's, it's different from your bathtub. You know, there's public fountains that are so beautiful in so many great cities. Uh, and then the virtual water. So, you know, Debbie has uh, an ocean behind her. I, I look at her uh, sitting there with the ocean and I get a little feeling about the ocean just from that virtual, you know, it's like three times removed from the actual ocean. There's the photograph, uh, there's the depiction of the photograph, and then there's the transmission of it to my screen. But that does a little bit of that blue mind work even so. Um, so virtual water can be art, photography, music, poetry, prose. Um, we're not just talking about VR headsets, we're talking about documentary films and the videos that you take on your smartphone uh, or GoPro or the wonderful doc documentaries or, or, you know, feature Hollywood is all over this. Like the film Moonlight won an Academy Award and I think Water should have gotten uh, in a, a supporting actress award. Um, <laughs> You know, you think of movies like Titanic, water was such a predominant character there. Uh, um, the Shape of Water. Um, even a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even, even like that film, this, A Star is Born, this, a yeah. lot of folks saw. Um, there's a scene where Jackson, the protagonist, is, is with his, his girlfriend 
she visits him in rehab and she says, how are you doing? And he says, I've been swimming. Mm. And water is his best friend. Water is his therapist while he's going through um, one of the hardest things that human can go through, uh, chemical addiction. And um, you know, the film doesn't, and it's not a happy ending, but his, what did work for him was water. Um, so you see it over and over showing up in, in films and literature, even advertising and marketing. You know, we talked about this, the, we see it in um, pharmaceutical companies and financial service companies use water to sell their products. And their products have nothing really to do with water. Why is that? They want you to move, they want to put you in that mood that builds trust and builds confidence in their brand. And the way they do that, the best way to do that is using water. And once you know that, you'll start noticing that in, in pharmaceutical ads and financial service ads, even Subaru uses surfing to sell cars uh, and so on and so forth. It's, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, so I, you know, I think we want to, we want to harness some of that power not just as a, a way to market products, but as a way to heal uh, those who need it most and, and everybody else, really. Well, it's not even ironic that the, the entire financial industry draws its language from water, you know? Right. We have banks and currency and flow and <laughs> <laughs> equity, yeah. right? Like, it's crazy. Yeah. So, so water permeates our entire existence. Um, so whether paddlers in the water in the middle of the ocean or whether, whether, whether you know, like this backdrop is virtual for you and we live in a lot of virtual worlds now and increasingly virtual worlds and augmented and, and, and artificial reality. What's that mechanism that has that primal connection for us be sticky? Like have you actually have it real for us, even if it's not real water? What, what's going yeah. on? So, it, you know, for, for a very, very long time, um, we, didn't, we didn't have knobs to turn that gave us water when we needed it. We didn't have bottles of water when we needed it. it was, the distribution of water was uh, very, very different, to put it mildly. So our ability to correctly and accurately and successfully position ourselves relative to good waters was a matter of life and death. If you, did it, if you got it wrong, you had a week. And then there was no more you. You, don't, you can't live a week without water. So if you, if you get, this is a pretty big deal. And so it's no surprise that we have the, the hardware, the software on board in our bodies and our minds to when we hear water or we see water, it sends us a signal as a human animal that says, yes, this is beautiful. You're in the right place. Life is good. So we get a rush of neurochemistry in response to certain signals of wellness. So speaking of water and wellness, and it's about as deep as it gets. And so here's a, here's a little experiment I've done. I've never done this on Zoom. I've done it in a room with you know, up to a thousand people. All right, so here's, here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I have a team, they're spread out all over the world right now. They have come into your home, they've locked the door and they've taken away your water. You will get water in three hours, but you're, you can't have water until then. So sorry about that. We're taking your water bottles away, we're turning off your water for three hours. I don't know about you, even suggesting that, uh, or wine, even <laughs> suggesting that it makes the su mere suggestion of the lack of water, even though you know I'm totally making this up, makes your mouth dry. Yeah, I actually, I actually experiencing that right now. That's crazy. Yeah. I have dry, I have dry mouth, wow. and and I, I just said no water for three hours, knowing uh -huh. that I have a glass of water right over here, and there's nobody limiting my water. And yeah, there's no one's drinking his water right now because there's dry mouth. It's amazing. So the mere suggestion that you you can't have the water makes you gives you a physiological response. So not surprisingly. The opposite is also true. You know, the sound of the water, the, you know, the, the sense that there is water, virtual or otherwise, um, the smell. So, you know, for water lovers, you know the smell of your water and, and you love it. Um, 
you know, you see a little glimpse, even in real estate, if, if they're marketing a house and they say partial ocean view, partial river view, that might mean you need to lean out the kitchen window, <laughs> extend as far as you can, and you might get a glimpse of the lake. Um, that is a, a, a selling point. You know, you will pay a premium for a partial view of the water because when you can see it, it puts, it puts you a little bit at ease. It gives you a sense of wellness and that, is, that has value. And we're beginning to understand truly how much value it has and not in, in just in dollars and cents, but in wellness and wellness points, you know, and uh, that doesn't always translate easily to dollars and cents. Um, and if, and, you know, kind of, you, you mentioned it early on, but if, when we take that for granted, when we undervalue our waters or anyone or anything, bad things happen every time throughout human history. Whenever we have undervalued each other in any way, the results have, have been not very, not very pleasant. Uh, true today. Um, so when we correctly value, fully value each other, fully value water, nature, forests, uh, animals, then things that when we fix that equation, uh, life gets better. Um, we're healthier. Yeah. Uh, the waters are healthier. Can we dial into that a bit more? That that is beautiful mm -hmm. because, you know, first you painted a picture where we have a primal connection, a very very old almost energetic, genetic kind of connection to water, you know, um, that affects our physiology. But um, then, then I see we're, we're making a bit of a mess of the waters on the planet. And I think everybody on the call here is concerned about that as well as, as natural stewards, you know, paddlers, pilots, people who care about water. What went off that we didn't, we stopped valuing it? What, what went off there? Yeah, I, you know, I remember early in my career, and it, this predates um, my academic studies, but early on, we were told to check anything remotely emotional at the door. Uh, your feelings generally are discounted. Anything related to emotion is not allowed into serious conversations. Whether you're in academia, in policy, in business, generally it's like, let's stick to the measurable uh, quote unquote facts. Um, and, and I get that and you know, I understand where that comes from. In the environmental movement, we, we went along with that in order to be taken seriously. And we jettisoned our feelings, uh, our spiritual traditions, any conversation about the sacred. It was kind of, it's kind of disallowed at the policy level among agencies, among the big NGOs, the funders. It's kind of like some of the things we talk about very freely are kind of like the, you know, you put those kind, that kind of language in your proposals, especially 10 or more years ago, your proposal is gonna go into the bin pretty quickly if you start talking about how, you know, anything related to emotion. Turns out, um, we learned from neuroscientists who study emotion that every single decision has an emotional component. That actually, the, the act of making a decision is an emotional act. The parts of your brain that do emotion are re required in order to make a decision. So uh, Antonio Damasio, neuroscientist at UCLA, wrote a book called Descartes' Error uh, back in 92. And the summary, just you can say you read it, uh, if you understand the summary, is every decision we make has an emotional component. You cannot, you know, uh, in terms of the the decision-making apparatus does not work without the emotional centers of our brain. You will just spin out on data collection and acquisition of information until the end. So, you know, if I said, if you were just a purely logical person and I said, um, what are you having for breakfast? You might say, well, I've got a spreadsheet that describes everything I've had for breakfast for my entire life. And I've analyzed my needs and I've got, I've got a recent blood test. Uh, actually, I calculated food miles for every, all of my options. And, I, and I've, I've consulted my financial advisor and I'm working on a little, a little more analysis uh, to figure out what to have for breakfast here, but I'm still collecting data. 
And I'll decide what that for breakfast in, I don't know, three or four more years uh, when I have all of the information I need. But no, that's not, how, we, we, decide, we make a decision and that there's an, our emotional decision-making apparatus kicks in. So that, that's just a, a fact of how it all works. We dialed that out uh, so thoroughly um, to the point where professors at Harvard Medical School are now training students how to be empathetic. The science of empathy is now, ne we need to reintroduce empathy into our uh, healthcare uh, educational system because it's been so thoroughly removed uh, as a, a part of a, a, a healing approach. Uh, that's exciting. That's both depressing and sad and very exciting and, and optimistic at the same time. You go, oh man, that, I didn't know that it got that bad, but oh good, they're teaching empathy to you know, these students who uh, need to understand that empathy is part of um, the healing arts and, and sciences. So uh, anyhow, that's real. It's real, Jay. I mean, real. It's, it's absolutely truth, right? real. Like it's obviously going to have both sides to it. It's going to have a, a tragedy built in because we're in a place where, you know, this has happened over time. And now we find ourselves in a great reset, a pause and, you know, reflecting on this. And your voice now is, is loud and clear, like the truth of what you're offering right now context is decisive so you know people are people are listening for this they're you can say they're thirsty for it right? yeah sure. you know, the same exercise that you just did they weren't thirsty before you know we don't right. we don't seem to notice it um so so in, in in pragmatic terms when when blue mind as a distinction you know started and, and now you've put it into put it into like a almost like a a framework and a methodology something to get my hands around you know i could read it i could digest it i could use it as a tool um but I also heard the term, you, when you interviewed, you talked about red mind and gray mind. And so now there's a world, you know, there's a world of c color. Uh, uh, can you give us a primer on that? Because, you know, whether someone's in the middle of a river paddling on their own or they're in a, they're in a big group, you know, in a pool or something, you know, what's this about? You know, it turns out that the best way to start to understand blue mind is to start with red mind. And, and red mind is, uh, is our new normal. You know, we're... We're more connected than ever. Way more information coming into our through our, through our senses than ever. Really, ever each of us is. Even if you're um, doing a good job limiting the amount of information flowing to you, there's still far more information coming to you than your ancestors or the child your your childhood version of yourself. Uh, it's astounding, really, how much information we process all day, every day. Um, we're, we're feeling a lot of people feel like they've fought, they're falling behind, um, that we're overcommitted, uh, overconnected, distracted this distraction problem is, is quite prevalent. Um, and this is our new normal. And I, you know, I like to tell the story, uh, in the U S there's a chain of restaurants called TGI, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. It's just a chain of pubs or, you know, you go and have a burger and a, beer or something so people work their butts off all week long it, friday get off of work grab their friends and family and they go out to a place like tgif where there's 15 tv screens each playing a different sporting event there's a soundtrack of music that you did not choose you may not even like it there's 100 people in there or at least there used to be making a lot of noise having their conversations you got a, a waiter who's bugging you a lot. You got a menu that's got an overwhelming number of choices on it. The beer menu is about a thousand different choices. Um, and this is how we relax at the end of a long week. That, that's what we choose to do to relax. I'm not saying people uh, on the screen right now are making that choice, but that's the norm, the new normal. So we, we have less, we have a sleep problem. We have a distraction problem. We have an anxiety problem. We have a stress problem an overflow of information problem. And if you don't keep that in check, and it in fact is really, it's all very useful. That information is useful. Red mind will save your life. It's the fight or flight response that we need. It's why we have it. Uh, the cortisol levels go up and we run or we fight. If you don't keep that in check, which many people have not kept in, in check, 
you will find yourself in gray mind, which you refer to, which is, is burnout, which is breakdown, which is overload, uh, which is when you get numbed out and indifferent and you're, you're not able to, you're, you're not able to do the red, even the red mind to things and you need a, a sick day or a sick week and you, or if you are still showing up, you're half, you're at half capacity because you're not even there. You're just, you're taking up a spot at your desk. Um, and we've all been there. So we've all felt red mind probably more than we would like. And we've all touched on a little bit of gray mind, some, some more than others. That can manifest itself as anxiety disorders and depression, um, not to be messed around with. Uh, and these are, these are part of, our, you know, our result of a, a churning modern society that has said, okay, sleep is for, for wimps and being busy is a badge of honor and working harder is the only solution to falling behind. The grind. Um, the grind. <laughs> yeah. and, and if you need it, here's another Red Bull uh, or a double. How about a Red, it a a red Bull? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, just double down on Red Mind and it'll be okay um, until it's not. And hmm. so, you know, a lot of people who are really in the trenches, and I, and I say they use the military metaphor because a lot of them, in fact, uh, are veterans, they move between red and gray. It's a toggling between full on 200% and breakdown. And then when they can get back, they go straight back to red mind and then they break down. It's just back and forth. And that can look a lot like post-traumatic stress in many cases. Instead of toggling between red and blue, which is a healthier place to be. And we're not arguing to get rid of red mind. Red mind's what makes us thrive and strive and work towards goals and deadlines and 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 grind sometimes you know but if it's all you got if you got one gear and it's red mind you will find yourself uh over there in the pile of ashes called gray mind i'm 100 percent guaranteed uh, in fact even prior to this global pandemic uh, the american psychological association said we have we have a red mind crisis we have a crisis of anxiety and stress even in our kids they they've done years and years of studies in the US, highest levels of anxiety they've recorded for a decade. The WHO said we have a crisis of workplace burnout. Uh, people are just under, underproductive and missing days of work because they're going too hard. And eventually they physically and mentally, their minds and bodies give out. So that was before uh, we even knew the, the word coronavirus. Uh, that, that, that was the state of affairs. Now, I don't know what the or, how many orders of magnitude more red mind and gray mind we have on the planet, but it's, it's certainly one order of magnitude more, just add a, add a 10, add a zero to that in numbers of people who are dealing with this. It's, it's significant. Um, so let's go, let's get off of red mind and gray mind because it kind of makes, makes me red minded to think and talk so much about it. But, but we can relate to it, Jay. Thank you. Because you really yeah. get where people are at, right? You know, it's, um, it's we real. have to have a compassion and a care for this place that we're all at. And, you know, I, I prefer to, instead of better, to, instead of we're all in this together, we're all connected, really. You found a, a path to share that we're really connected through the water. And when we're not connected to the water, then it's something else. It's red or gray. Yeah. So, yeah, please talk about Blue Mind. There's, there's, there's a potential budding water ambassadors on the on the call now, you know, these are people who are supercharged about water because they're on it all the time. And there's potentially people who have no access to it or, or the best they can do is a bathtub or a shower. Um, so, so prepare us for, for a future of Blue Mind. Yeah, so I, I would say the, the thing, if, if, that, if the red mine and gray mine and blue mine conversation resonates, use it. It's a good way to talk to people and yourself, your family members, your loved ones, and maybe your clients and your friends co-workers, it's a good way to talk about mental health and emotional health in a way that is, doesn't, doesn't feel as heavy as it can feel. It doesn't feel as stigmatized. And granted, we would love to work towards a time when this, the stigma goes away. In the meantime, we can use this simplified 
granted oversimplified color-coded uh, language to start the conversation. And um, you know, in our work with veterans, a lot of times they don't want, particularly the guys, they don't want to talk about how they feel just because they're, they're part of that school. You know, it's like, fuck up, suck it up. You don't tell me how you feel. Just here's a Red Bull, get back to work, double down. And if you can find a way where it feels okay to talk about how you feel, which can be a, a, this color-coded red, blue, gray, and get that conversation started, that might be a really useful tool. So if you're, you know, if you're paddling with, with someone and you introduce, and you, you know, we have great conversations on the water, a whole other, whole other conversation of why that's, <laughs> that's the case. Um, take that time to you know, plant some of these ideas and share, share that. Talk about it. You know, what does it feel like when you feel a red mind for you? What's the cause of that? What does it feel like when you feel this thing we call a gray mind for you? What is that? How does that show up in your life? What happens? Uh, and then you pull back over to blue mind. For you, what, what is, where do you find your blue mind? Is it on, is it on a lake? Is it paddling? Uh, is it in your bathtub? Is it putting on, uh, like I put on last night, um, the sound of the ocean with a thunderstorm in the background, just a two hour loop. Uh, it's, it's virtual water, but if, if that takes a little bit of the edge off that helps you sleep, um, great. So have those conversations. So that, that cartoon version, that red, gray, blue cartoon version of very, some very complex emotional health uh, uh, modes can be really useful and help people find, find their way into the conversation, have a, maybe understand themselves and each other a little bit better, and then get you to this application uh, of, of blue mind and uh, blue mind therapy, if you want to call it that. Uh, drop the word, by the way, drop the word therapy if it's problematic, because some, lots of groups I've worked with, you say the word therapy, they're out. Uh, they, they don't want to do anything related to therapy. But if you say, hey, let's get in a kayak uh, and go check out the bay, um, a lot of time in the kayak, what you're basically doing is meditating. And if you had called it meditation or therapy, <laughs> it would be a no-go. But if you just if you call it a fun time in a kayak, it's a yago, yeah and uh, it gets the job done just as well. It's meditative therapy. So... You know, like all these kayak fishing therapy programs for veterans, it's kind of like drop, drop the word meditation, drop the word therapy, just get a fishing pole, get in your, in your boat. And, uh, you know, I mean, everybody on here who's been kayak fishing knows that there's a lot of time you're not fishing and there's a lot of time you're not paddling. There's a whole bunch of time where you're sitting quietly looking at water meditatively, uh, contemplatively, calmly. Um, and uh, I, I love that, Jay, because the whole thing about about avoiding therapy is, you know, we have equine therapy. If you tell people they're going to go have a therapy with horses, they won't go. Yeah. They just go and ride horses and pet them and everything like that. And the horse takes everything on. It's awesome. So it thank works. you. Yeah. Thank you for that bridge. Right. Because, uh, you know, for people going to be a water ambassador or an access to healing with water, you know, to wellness, then then there is a conversation. Right. But what I'm hearing from you is that is the current of that conversation is emotional. Yeah. It's like the frequency oh, yeah. of emotion, right? It's the water then carrying from me to another mm -hmm. to help them. Uh, and, and there's a way we can, we can open that bridge to compassion and action. Yeah. So um, what, what are some of the things that people can do? Like you mentioned, listening to the sounds of water. When we talk about virtual water, a lot of people are not able, able to go out now or, or may not have access to water at this particular time in history. Maybe when they're listening in a few months or a year, it's going to change, right? But um, um, you know, what are some of the other ideas you've offered people for, for that, and even for our, our, our people who can access water. How do they, how do they supercharge a blue mind? Yeah, I would say try, find something you can do every day, and it, it may not involve you know, getting out on, on the water in a boat, um, but if you just make a decision that every day I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a moment of blue mind, one way or another, and then take a quick inventory of what is, where you're sitting right now, what's within 50 feet? What water is within 50 feet of you right now? How many sinks? How many showers? How many bathtubs? How many hoses? And it, like, stick it, turn on the hose, grab that hose and put it above your head, freezing cold, 
in the morning out in your lawn, out in the patio, out in the driveway, your neighbors will think you're a nut. Trust me on this one, do it. Try that one. That's a, that is, that's a great way to start your day. Um, so all of those, take a quick inventory within 50 feet of where you're sitting right now. How could you get your blue mind on with your domestic water uh, and then your virtual water, whether it's you know, putting on some, some whale songs, uh, listening to some whale songs yesterday, and it was just lovely. Beautiful. Uh, just background music. Instead of the news, looping bad news uh, <laughs> in the background, put whale songs on in the background while you work, while you do your thing. Um, you're, awesome. you know, some people probably have uh, photographs or paintings of their favorite water uh, in their home or in their office. Um, use those. My, my suggestion, suggestion is move them. So you have uh, maybe the artwork that's hanging on your wall has been on that spot for a decade. Swap it with another piece of artwork and all of a sudden that piece of artwork is, you'll see it again through new eyes. Uh, it's amazing. So simple. It costs nothing. Just move it around a little bit and it, it sort of reactivates reactiva the energy of the artwork to put, take it out of the living room, put it in the bedroom, take it out of the bedroom, put it in the kitchen, put it in the hallway, um, put it someplace like the, even the, wherever you spend time, the garage. Um, and uh, that's a simple tip. I also, here's another sort of pro tip. Um, our kids used to love these bath time crayons. Like you crayons, you can use their soap crayons. You can draw on the side of the bathtub. Get some of those for yourself. Put them in your shower because in the shower you will get a good idea that you don't want to forget, and you will forget it. You'll say, "I'm never. This is a great idea. I'm not going to forget this." And then you get out, you towel off, and you think, "What was that idea? <laughs> I totally forgot it." So. Write it on the wall, write it, even if it's an acronym or just a, like a half a word or something that will help you remember, not forget it. And then when you get out, just snap a picture of the, the soap crayon writing on the wall of, of your shower or your bathtub, and now you've got it, right? So it's, you don't wanna bring technology into your sacred shower, bath, water time, but a crayon so that when those ideas pop in your head, you can jot them down. Um, so, you know, really, really, it's about building there. Diane's kind of fortunate there. I got the nice view. Um, take, be aware of what you, you've got in your personal inventory. Um, that 50 foot radius and then go to like, bump that out to a mile walking distance from where you are right now. Urban water, wild water, domestic water. What's within walking distance? No cars involved. Just a bike, your feet, you just go out. Um, maybe you're bringing your portable kayak with you to do this. Uh, and then you go a little further. You go like, it's, it's within, it's a day trip. It's a little, a little effort to get there, but you can do it and get home for dinner. It's amazing. Like most of us will have a pretty good list. You know, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm very much aware that, you know, the have, have not aspect of this conversation. When you go through that process, this, the group of people who have no access at the end of that process was very small. Um, and we do wanna work uh, on access for everyone. But when you think about it that way, you start in your, your home within 50 feet and then you bump it out and bump it out within a, you know, a day's public transport from where you're sitting, can you get to water and then get your blue mind activated? For most people, the answer is yes. And the other part of it is for most people, it is vastly underutilized in a therapeutic or public health or an emotional health or social health way. So there's just so much potential in this conversation. It gives me so much optimism. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm so excited to be having this conversation and knowing <laughs> that you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a business, a kayak company is lighting it up you know, and, and leading the charge is, you know, you can't be other than optimistic um, in that context. So we have, we have a lot we can do with these ideas uh, and help the vast majority of people who need it uh, in some very tangible way. Thank you, Jay. I tell you, you know, what you've offered is an extraordinary gift. And it, and it feels like we've just been 
you know, playing around a shallow brook <laughs> for, for 40 minutes. We're going, a little, we're going a little over time, but it's so rich and I'm, and I'm caught in the current. So uh, I want to go, you know, just a few more minutes and then we'll get to Q&A. But there's actually a couple of critical questions I wanted to ask you. I want to give you the opportunity, Jay, given the pathway you've given us, given the, given the access to something. Um, is there anything you've never said that you've always wanted to say mm. to the world at this time? Mm. Um, you know, I, I, it's not, this isn't really a profound, a profound thing. It's more just a, a very, very personal, very current thing. But uh, our daughter is graduating from high school um, this right now and is, uh, I read her senior reflection last night. She asked me to edit it. It's just a short document that she shares with her whole school. And um, within her senior reflection, she, she went through a, a pretty serious personal health crisis in four or five years. Uh, and we weren't sure um, she would get through. And um, within her senior reflection, she um, made, made the point that uh, her art, her photography, specifically the dark room and the ocean uh, together were what got her through. Like she was able to write a senior reflection as a, a living human being. Um, she's alive because of her art uh, and the ocean. Um, and I, I read that, I was editing it with her last night and I got a little choked up, and um, and it's very personal. But it, but the reason I'm sharing that is because I know many of our young people are have felt like she feels has felt um, they're maybe less equipped than some of us who've been through things or been around. I mean, we're all feeling a lot, a lot of a lot of grief right now. Uh, whether we name it grief or not, but our young people are, are so susceptible. And so I see the opportunity for us, when I look around the screen, um, I don't know if anybody is a teenager, but I'm gonna guess no. Uh, grab, make sure, make sure you're, uh, if you have access to the young people in your life that you're, um, you're sharing blue mind with them because that's, that's uh, so important. They're young, their brains are still forming. They're building their nostalgia. Uh, they're building their ability to make decisions. And if they don't know about what we know, they're not going to do that as well as they could. Um, they're being told they're the future. They're being told they need to solve all of this whether it's climate change or, or pandemics or diseases, or they're being told that they're, they're the hope, they're the future, they're, and they're carrying that red mind for us. Um, and so as a parent and to fellow parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and educators, make sure the kids that you know understand this. It's, the, it's maybe, one of the greatest gifts, along with art and music, that you could give a kid is a love of a lifelong love of water, um, and it's not that hard to do. I mean, you grab your track kayak and yeah, go down into the water and, and or whatever it is, get in the pool, teach them to swim, uh, teach them how to float on their back, teach them how to free dive, teach them the love and the joy and the peace and the solitude that comes from. Uh, being near and on and under water, um, so important. So I guess that would be, that just kind of really hit me uh, yesterday and last night. Um, but we, can, we can take it up a notch right now. I'm not hearing that message in all, all the chatter. Um, I'm hearing it from our conversations and, and several others, but in the, take it to the mainstream as much as we can. Um, Make sure none, none of these kids graduate from high school without understanding their blue mind, um, having access to it, and then practicing it regularly. Uh, um, 
I, you know, adults as well. And we need to remind ourselves, we need to remind each other here. But really, if we can, if we can pass this on to the younger generation uh, and then they integrate that in their businesses, their new businesses and their new roles, and their, you know, they become parents and leaders. I think that's, that'll happen really quickly. But, well, Jay, thank you so much for that. We yeah. have a teenage son, so that really, yeah. uh, really hits home seeing what yeah. he's experiencing, you know? So <clears throat> yeah. um, you started the story of, of, of following a turtle. And, you know, in many indigenous cultures, a turtle holds the earth. So it's been a real privilege to have you because um, I got who you, who you are. Um, so we're coming to the end of the call and we kind of open up the QAs for anybody who's still hopefully on, <laughs> you know, we've gone a bit over time, uh, but we need to go there. Um, we can't control the water. And, uh, and as we come to the ocean uh, and open up the QA, um, uh, I, I, uh, I just want to thank you on behalf of the whole community and young people who will be listening to this, uh, you know, possibly uh, years from now. You know, it's, it's, it's a timeless voice. Uh, and we need as water to be aware of that, that potential of what you're offering. It is speaking to, to the present and the future. So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, it is forming the future that we want to live in. Awesome. Well, one last thing I'll, I'll, I'll offer to all of ah! you. We, um, this is a blue marble, which has become, you know, if you, if you've got a copy of the book, you'll find a blue marble right there on the spine oh. of the book. And then the last chapter describes it in great detail, but it's just become kind of the symbol uh, of this conversation. And in more socially connected times, we, if you receive a marble, you're meant to pass it along. Uh, and in this sort of social, socially distanced time, <laughs> just pass them kind of virtually through the screen uh, to all of you. And, and so um, they're, they're shared as small gestures of gratitude. And of course, the blue marble represents our, our home water planet um, as seen you know, through the lens of those, those astronauts the first time. And so when we share, when we, when we get back to a little more um, social sharing, I suggest that when you, when you go paddling, you take a blue marble with you and, uh, and pass it on, you'll know who and when uh, and it's kind of a, it's a surprisingly cool thing. If you, if you're out on the water, having a great conversation with someone you connect with and you pull out a marble and just say, Hey, small, small gesture, pass this on. Um, it can really, it can really sort of light things up and, and, and also ground things in a way. And um, we've shared a lot of them over the years and they just continue to be passed on. So that's the goal. Take whatever piece of this conversation and pass it on like a blue marble uh, to those who need to hear it, whether it's a, a link to our work, a link uh, to this series um, w in whatever form you, you feel. We have you know, videos and uh, the 100 Days of Blue Camp uh, Challenge, the 100 Days of Blue Mind Challenge is coming up. Um, just keep passing it on. Make those ripples. Uh, and I uh, really appreciate to be uh, here with y'all and having this conversation. Jay, I love it. <laughs> we, should, we should all be losing our marbles, you know? <laughs> it's the crazy ones that are gonna inherit the earth yeah, and actually yeah, right. start, to, start to create something new. <laughs> so, so beautiful, delightful, we're so grateful. Uh, you know, thank you for kicking, kicking us off. I mean, the, the synergy here, the, the flow, uh, you know, and, and it's, gonna, it's gonna create the first drop with a ripple where we hope more guests, more speakers, more insight, more luminaries, more wisdom, you know, accumulate. And we hope that you'll always be part of that community. You know, uh, Track has talked about a wisdom council. You know, I think it's really a water council. And that people like you uh, will continue to help us, uh, you know, guide us down that, that channel of integrating, integrating this water wisdom and water wellness into corporate, you know, operating systems, you know. Um, and, and, it, and it's possible if we are, if we have a blue mind, it really is. So, I'll say, I will just say it's, it's possible and it does require uh, apex leadership like the kind we see in Nolan. And, and by apex leadership, I mean the leaders who aren't looking left and right to see what others are doing. They're just saying, I got, I got this point of the spear and I'm, 
and I'm, I'm flying. Um, so I really appreciate that aspect of what you guys are doing and, and the way you're doing it. So thank you for being um, the apex leaders we need. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, to everybody listening, everybody who joined us, thank you for your time. Thank you for flowing with us. Uh, and, and stay tuned. Uh, you know, we'll be, we'll be moving, we'll moving into the ocean and, and into the next river soon. So uh, thanks, Nolan, for creating this. Uh, and thank you, everybody. We'll say goodbye. Mm -hmm.